The LinkedIn Podcast Network is sponsored by TIAA. TIAA makes you a retirement promise, a promise of a guaranteed retirement paycheck for life. Learn more at TIAA.org backslash promises pay off. LinkedIn presents. Speaking up and being heard and having influence in getting what you're asking for. Speaking up is an essential skill at work, in life, and in leadership. But it scares most of us. It certainly scares me. So in this LinkedIn Live special, Nihar Chaya and I are going to talk about how to speak up strategically, how to ask what you need and what you want from your boss, or how to be heard in a loud room. Hope it's helpful. Hello. Hi, Maura. How are you? I'm okay. I'm good. I uh, I took the red eye home from Vegas, and I really struggle with the red eye these days. I used to be able to do it, no problem, and now just meh. Was this uh, this week? Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah, just Tuesday. So, yeah. Yeah. How are you? I'm good. I haven't uh, been traveling in a little bit, but... I need to start doing that. I, I haven't taken a red eye in a few years, but I know that it's, uh, it's intense. You're not missing very much. <laughs> well, let, let's dive in. I mean, this is a topic that you were excited to talk about. Yeah. But I also think given, given what's happening in Israel and Palestine, it, it, it has some urgency because a lot of what I'm seeing is people's anxiety about speaking up about how they feel and what they feel they need from colleagues, social media, right? I mean, I, I deleted Instagram from my phone yesterday. Mm. I, I felt it was just the discourse was. So I think there's a lot of resonance around the idea of how to speak up and when and why and effectively. Yeah, I, I propose this topic more, as you probably remember, because I was thinking about, you know, what do I generally hear a lot from clients and, you know, what's kind of under the surface in terms of a challenge that comes up. And this shows up a lot in assertiveness, uh, you know, in when you feel like you've been wronged by somebody at work or things like that. But, you know, it, since we thought, scheduled this and as you saw with the events in Israel, it's like, you're so right. There's a whole layer of this around speaking up around needs and you know kind of broaching topics that people don't really want to talk about but are really you know uh creating the climate for for healthy work relationships or maybe getting in the way of them uh and i couldn't agree with you more it's it's such a um it's such a challenging time i think to know when to uh how to how to operate how to speak about things but also you don't want to be too silent mm -hmm. uh, because when you don't say anything, it really does send a message also about whether you care enough, right? Right. And, 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 and it's become, uh, I have had friends on social media and I have seen posts from them that have said, like, I expect you to speak up right now. If you don't speak up, I judge that, which I have, I don't know. I have feelings about that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Tell me more about that. Uh, I don't want to derail us from our like practical and helpful topic, but I don't think that anybody has a responsibility to speak up on social media if they're not directly involved in the situation because social media is tricky. Yeah, it absolutely is. I also think that there's a, there's a layer of obligation that is in that kind of request or that demand that somebody's making. And I think that doesn't, that's not really fair in general, you know, uh, it's almost kind of making you have to say something when you're not quite ready or don't say this, don't say that. And that's not, that doesn't feel inclusive, you know? Yeah. No. So, okay. So, so tell us what you mostly, what's the question that you hear from your clients around yeah. this topic? I think it's, you know, uh, how do I speak up in a way that doesn't create more conflict? Mm. Uh, you know, how do I say something that really about something that bothered me? but I don't want it to, re they don't want, I don't want them to retaliate or make me look as if I'm being sensitive. Um, that comes up a lot. 
uh, I'll, I'll, by the way, also hierarchically, this comes up. So what if my boss is acting a certain way? How do I speak up around that? Um, and it really is in degrees, you know, obviously on the one extreme, you can see things that are super inappropriate, that things happen at work and you have to speak up. And then on the more kind of benign area might be something as simple as, you know, hey, boss, kind of back up a little bit and let me kind of have some empowerment here. You know, uh, I have a few of those examples where, you know, leaders want to lead, but they're kind of being micromanaged. Uh, not to. So things like that. Oh, tell us about that. And um, <laughs> listeners, if you have a question around speaking up, how to do it, please throw it in the comments. Um, but yeah, let's dive into that. How? Yeah. Wow. Well, you know, I wish I had the, 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 the silver bullet on that. But I think first off, the, the, the one thing I always say is um, understand that you have the right to, to assert yourself. That I think that at a very core, at the very core of it, a lot of us, I think, are wrapped up in, do I even have the right to say this? You know, you might think a lot about what this will mean for my future or, or to other person, but that kind of clouds a little bit of the, 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 um, the core value that you should have for yourself around what to say. Mm. I think then that the piece of it, and this is one thing I, I struggle with a lot too, is the conventional wisdom would say, you know, make sure you are emotionally stable. Don't, don't get, don't go into it angry. And, and I think there's a lot of merit to that, but I also think that it's sometimes it's impractical, you know, to, to really in the moment to have a witty comeback, you know, it's just, it's just not the, the thing that a lot of people can do, especially when you're like surprised by how somebody's treating you or saying something. So I think knowing what your triggers are can be really helpful. Um, knowing what might be the things that make you uh, feel more sensitive. And then I think I, it's the idea that try not to let it linger mm -hmm. without addressing it. Because that really can make it worse. You know, at some point we can almost start thinking about things that they didn't even do or say, but lump it into the reality of it because we haven't said anything and we're building our own narrative in our in our head. My my friend Christine calls that fret festering. When oh, when you yeah, just let great. when you let something a conversation that you want to have but you're scared to have or you won't have and it just you don't have it and it's, it festers. Yes, I think that emotions and anger can be very strategic, mm -hmm. and so. Back to your point of you're supposed to be cool as a cucumber when you're talking about something difficult. I, I've never really bought that. Yeah. But I don't know. I may be wrong. No, I agree. I mean, I think some people are are wired in different ways. You know, um, I'm actually watching the uh, Beckham documentary right now on Netflix. Oh, David Beckham. Oh. Yeah, really, really good. Um, and I think most people that ever follow David Beckham would be like, that guy's cute, cool as a cucumber. He is always just chill. Yeah. You know? And um, there's a few moments back in the 90s when he had really was the enemy of his people because of a, a penalty that he got in the World Cup. And, um, and you know, sometimes you look at him and you think, how is it possible for somebody to be that cool? And, you know, for 20 years or so, he did say, he's like, I've hurt, I hurt inside. But I never talked about it until even building, filling this deck documentary. I think some people are just wired like that. You know, I, I'm not, um, I, <laughs> you know, I wear my emotions on my sleeve. I grew up in a family that did that. Uh, we all were just very kind of vocal and visible when we were upset. Um, so I think, you know, every now and then I would find myself wishing that I had a little bit of that training in a family that was different, but you know, it is what it is. I think that. The one thing that I have learned, though, is, again, personalizing for myself what my triggers are and being okay with it. Hmm. So, for instance, if I feel like, hey, I know this is going to bother me, a moment where I feel like I need to assert myself, I recognize that taking a day really helps me. You know, I, I can always come back to it tomorrow. I don't need to be so trigger happy right now. Um, or, for instance, you know, I think another, mis another thing that I think a lot of leaders fall or managers, employees fall into is, Sometimes we think we can just email people about it. You know, like email is a nice, like safe way to just get it all out there. And that's just the worst thing to email do. Email you know? is the worst. Yeah. I mean, it's there forever. You know, it's like you, you, you do it and you feel good, but then you're wondering, are they going to respond? And if they didn't respond, you're thinking that I say too much. Um, having that conversation is, is so important, even though that's obviously more high stakes and can be being a little bit nerve wracking. I, I think, I think that's a really good point. I mean, I think for me, I have a challenge speaking up, um, in the moment. And so I will sort of blank in the moment. And then 
afterwards know everything I want to say. And then (laughs) my husband and I, when we fight, I will send him text messages after the fact. (laughs) And that's terrible. Like that is, I mean, right. That is really not good practice. And I've done that at work in a little way too. So how do you, how are you strategic about speaking up? Is it about preparation? Is it about using time? What's the cadence of doing it well? So I, I always find that if I can put my se- myself in the other person's shoes, it, it does clarify things a little bit better. That doesn't mean that I need to necessarily agree with them. Mm. Um, but I try to think of it like, how would this person feel getting an email right now from me? You know, are they going to even listen to it? You know, are they going to find a reason to just be like, wow, now I don't even like this person at all. Right. You they're know? just angry. Yeah, they're just angry. So it's like I try to separate the substance from the the, the medium and, uh, and and try to think about it like, again, how, what's the what's the easiest, simplest way to get get on the on the attentiveness of this person as opposed to just trying to vent for my own purposes is this for me or is this really for them mm. and and i do think that it, by the way venting is important you know like you don't have to run to the solution or like compromise or negotiation immediately i think it's important to process the, it ourselves and sometimes you can't do it on your own like it does help to talk to your spouse or talk to a trusted person first and get it out you know you might say hey this happened to me and can you believe this person did this and this and that and Hopefully you'll have friends that, that will actually, uh, you know, understand that instead of saying, well, you shouldn't have said this. Um, but it's like, once you process that out a little bit, I think that can deescalate a little bit, a little bit in terms of how you present the message. Yeah. Um, and then strategically to your point, I think the idea is also to make sure you go into that conversation with a game plan. You know, it's not really productive to just make it a lot about, let me just go and dump everything that I, that I felt on you now that we're talking. Right. Because again, you want to think about not just what you're saying, but how it's going to be heard. It can't just be, well, so what I'm hearing is don't make the intended party of your difficult conversation your first port of call. Right. right. Get it out there, vent, workshop it to your dog, mm-hmm. to your therapist, yeah. your <laughs> partner, whatever. Yeah. Right. Because then you're, you learn also. Yeah. And then Absolutely. don't just make it about your feelings. Yeah. Well, I think it goes back to a lot of the things you and I have spoken about with anxiety and how the mind kind of, you know, you can't believe everything your mind tells you, right? right? And so it's, your mind is going to send signals that you're being threatened right now by this, by this moment. Um, can you observe that for a little bit and, and not feel as if, you know, you're not allowed to respond, you are allowed to respond, but, um, but, but just know that you might be kind of diminishing your case if you don't manage it the right way. Yeah. Yeah. Um, there's a comment actually that yes, just came Ashley, up. Yes, Ashley, yeah. let's uh yeah. let's put your comments on the screen. Gender differences. Yes. Thoughts around this? Um, yeah. I'll read it for the podcast. Can you talk a little bit about gender differences when speaking up? I see many times when women speak up in meetings when they say qualifying statements like can I interrupt or do you mind if I share? Whereas men, they just take over the air and share their point. Yeah. I, I think that's true, you know, and uh um so at the risk of um generalizing here, I, I would say that it's true that that I think men women do that. Not all women I would say do that. I've I've worked with women who are pretty pretty assertive in the in the moment too. Um but I don't know that that's necessarily wrong to say, can I interrupt? Mm-hmm. Do you mind if I share? Um I go back to, it's, it's a weird analogy, but like Seth Godin talks about permission marketing. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, it's like, instead of just bombarding people with marketing stuff, you can ask them, can I send you a, a newsletter? Can I, you know, I think that really is a nice way to inoculate yourself from attack, from the feeling of attack. Like you're, you're saying, Hey, do you mind if I actually share with you what I'm thinking about? Um, because again, we're all humans, you know, not all of us want to feel it's like when you said the earlier example about people expecting you to say something on social media. Right. They should really say some they should first ask you, hey, do you feel like it might be a good idea for you to share something? Right. Yeah. Actually appeal to your right, your agency. Right. As opposed to do this, do that. 
So that's just my perspective on it. I think there's men should learn how to do that. <laughs> It'll be valuable. I think there's also, there's racial differences, right? Sure. There's cultural differences. And so your ability to speak up with ease and have it received is a super probably nuanced and intersectional thing. Yeah. Um, Sarah has a question. Having a game plan is a good idea if you're the one who's initiating. But what happens when your approach attacked and you need to respond? That's a great question. Oh, that's such a great question. Yeah. Um, so I, I can honestly tell you that, you know, I've, I've been on the receiving end. You know, in, in my culture, you know, I'm Indian American. I was born and raised here. But like my parents from India, a lot of, I'm sure my, my brothers and sisters from India might be able to agree with this. We're usually not, you know, conflict ready people we're not we're not the type of people to say i'm going to give it right back to you we're more like a little bit more submissive and uh you know passive in that respect when it comes to conflict and i found myself in situations like that too where i would not have the the wherewithal to respond when i was attacked or or felt um you know kind of shamed or something like that in, in a public setting um one of the things that i learned from i don't know where it was but Sometimes a comeback could just be something like, hey, is everything okay with you? You know, like, <laughs> is everything all right? You know, it's like you're not even really giving into what they said, but you're kind of mocking them a little bit on like, why would you even say something like that? Or having empathy. You know? Like if this is someone that you have a relationship yeah. with and it's out of mm -hmm. character, I think it's totally legit also to be like, whoa, like. <laughs> right. Yeah. Ouch. Yeah. You know, that's, that's, a, that's pretty intense. And you and that's a great point because then they might also realize that, wow, I was out of line. I didn't realize how that came out, um, you know? And uh, yeah, a lot of times these are like misunderstandings that that get blown out of proportion because of the tone or because of something that was unexpected. Yeah. Um, at the risk of sounding like a total idiot, I... Um... I go to I go to a nail salon very frequently and um I canceled an appointment with them abruptly and they were like no you can't have your money back no oh, wow. and I I kind of became a Karen like I was <laughs> I, it was not okay yeah. I was having a terrible day and I called them like 20 minutes after the fact and I said I'm really sorry that I talked to you like that like I wow. understand your policy I really apologize for that. And um, this, this should say, I mean, this is, and, and I felt, but it, but it was, but I felt like it was okay because I've been going to see them for years. But, you know, I do think that we also have to have grace with people who we totally. do know that we can lose it sometimes. And um, I wasn't, I was, I was ashamed of my behavior. Um, and very grateful that they heard me out and were like, it's okay. You can still be mm. our customer. Um, so I'm curious also about repair. You know, mm. I, 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 I do a lot of the sort of toxic boss situations that I hear, um, feel very all or nothing. Like I'm going to speak up, but then yes. it's going to be over. <laughs> Talk about repair. Oh man, this is a great, great, um, aspect of it too. So I think resetting work relationships is so critical. I'm not saying I'm great at it, but I do believe in the value of it. It's, uh, you know, the idea of like not burning bridges is real. I think the world is small, particularly as you start moving up in your, in your career and you start kind of getting a lot of experience in one industry or in one, you know, area of, of work, uh, people talk, people evaluate you based on what other people said about you. And, you know, again, I think just having, like you said, grace for people or, or having the ability to see that we're all humans and we all kind of prone to misunderstanding is, is really important. I think, in fact, if you can remember that relationships can be repaired, um, they oftentimes actually get better. Hmm. So one example that I, that I, I've found, I've found this personally, and I've seen this with my clients is that, People act so differently when they're in a work environment with you than outside of work. And because it's so wrapped up in like your identity of I'm the boss or more importantly, I'm your peer. And, and, you know, it's my silo, my turf. And there's a lot of threat feelings of threat around that are competition. And yet when that person, when one of the people happens to leave for a different company, it's like it never even happened. Like they're friends. Everything's yep. great. Right. 
And so it, it's baffling to me that, you know, we, we would be willing to say, to cut everybody off as soon as there's one little faux pas that happens, right? Instead of saying, actually, let me see if I can address this. Now, if the person doesn't actually want to meet you halfway and really say like, let's both work in this together, then I think it's great to just give up on it, yeah. uh, right? But at the same time, you know, trying to see that there's possibility of making it better, um, it, there's an optimism there, I feel, because you can find that actually maybe the two, both of you are thinking, wow, you know, this, this work environment made us, made the worst, brought the worst out of us instead of actually who we really are. Do you work with people who feel that they need to speak up in meetings more frequently or more powerfully? Any advice there? Yes. Yeah, Absolutely. So, you know, Selena Rizvani, right? I think we're, we're both, uh, yeah, LinkedIn top voice. She's a great friend of mine. She has a, I believe she has a great piece of advice on this, um, where one thing is just having some wing men or wing women, mm. you know, around you in the, in the group, right? Actually having a little bit of an arrangement or implicit kind of talk about, Hey, when I, when I need to speak up, will you support me? You know, and vice versa, because like it is, there's strength in numbers. You know, and if if some person is feeling wronged in a setting and, and they're the only one feeling wronged, then, yeah, you can feel like you, wow, you, I need to like kind of, uh, I feel very diminished. But actually, if you have somebody that's able to support you, say, I agree with what so, so-and-so was saying, that can be really helpful. Mm. Um, so that's, again, goes back to the strategic way of creating something uh, that can help with speaking up. And then I think just in terms of um, the idea of speaking up on your own, I think like anything else, it takes practice. So getting into a place, a rhythm where, first of all, you are actually speaking more often. I think, you know, I'm the kind of person, I don't know if you feel this way, um, a lot of introverts I work with, they're super thoughtful in their minds. And so they're not the first people to talk in meetings. Mm -hmm. So a lot of times they'll say, well, I don't want to just be, a, I don't want to talk for the sake of talking. I just wait until something needs to be said. But that can make them seem a little bit aloof and not involved. And so if you're somebody who's never really talked before, and then all of a sudden the only time you talk is you're defending some, yourself or you're attacking somebody, uh, <laughs> or, you know, it's a little bit weird, yeah. right? So I think getting into the rhythm of actually participating is really important so that you become comfortable with your own voice and people are comfortable with what you're trying to assert. And then when things really happen, you're able to say, hey, listen, you know, back up a little bit or let's kind of let's talk about that issue that happened. I think that's incredible advice. I just want to actually like pull that out a little bit because uh, you know, there is data that if you're, if you're quiet in meetings, just saying anything soon in the meeting, even like mm -hmm. it is a beautiful day, you know, mm -hmm. gives a signal that you're present. And yeah. so to your point, it doesn't seem jarring when all of a sudden you, you, lay in later in the meeting. And, and I, when I, when I, when I work with people who are introverted, yes, but more frequently socially anxious. Yes. I do, do really encourage them to sort of get in early in the meeting, <clears throat> even if it's something innocuous and mm -hmm. in the little sort of small talk, which is difficult for a lot of us, especially on zoom, mm -hmm. but just asserting that like, I'm here, I'm paying attention so glad that you had a great lunch, you know, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It, it builds that community. Absolutely. Yeah. It's interesting. I saw this, um, somebody was talking about body language on zoom mm. and, you know, how to build trust, uh, and charisma and things like that. Their particular research had said that you want to show your hands within the first few minutes of a meeting because it just it just humanizes you and it connects you instead of just looking like this talking head to each other well also that you're not typing and multitasking oh, yeah, so so i actually use my hands strategically during zoom meetings okay. um because i want to show people that i am paying attention to them that i am yes. not you know and so i think that you know again this stuff, stuff is also new but um right yeah signal but it reminds me of the same concept which is you kind of want to make yourself known and memorable early or like say something that's going to be memorable or do something uh 
Yeah. But because you, I, I'm sure you can imagine, right? A lot of meetings, people are still on, not showing their video, yeah. you know, <laughs> and they're Guilty. just kind of wondering, like, <laughs> yeah. and in the big team meeting, you're thinking, are these people even on, right? They might be doing their own work and stuff. So, right. Oh, um, you can hear yeah. the clack. Yeah. So we're going to have to wrap it. I want to ask you one last question. And I want the audience, this is sort of a thoughtful question. You know, a lot of people need help getting in touch with their feelings and the fact that they even want to speak up. Mm -hmm. That's something, you know, not everyone is like me who has like 8 million emotions a second and wants to share <laughs> all of them. And so I'm curious what your advice is when you're working with clients to help them get to the place of, you know, I need to speak up about this. Yeah. Yeah. So I was just having a conversation with a client last week about, you know, moving from the status quo to like things that are really important. One of, one of which is like work-life balance and being home with the family. And, you know, I really believe that until something really, unfortunately, tragic or really unfortunate happens unexpectedly, it's hard to really understand the gravity of these things. Mm. You know, until you, your kids go to college, you won't, you won't look back, you won't remember how much you missed because you're at the office until, you know, 10 p.m. every day. You don't want to make that mistake. And I think sometimes giving, getting in touch with the fact that there might be some things that you need to be saying to get more of what you need really just taking some inventory of that you know we can kind of tell by even our personal behaviors or like if, maybe if we find ourselves snapping at certain people or if we find ourselves a little bit off in terms of emotions i think there's always something there that's telling us that like the body keeps the score kind of thing you know but i think taking that time to really appreciate it is important yeah because again the other piece of it too is not just speaking up for my own behalf but speaking up for the behalf of other people who might be victimized or or need that voice. That's exactly right. And as a leader, it's so important to do that. Right? It's so important. Right. And I do think tuning into your body, I mean, when I tell people to get in touch with their anxiety, is there a meeting or a person that you're always anxious about yes, the yes. night before, the morning of that, that your body's telling you something. And so getting in touch with that can help you have this sort of moment of, okay, wow, something's going on here. Mm -hmm. Maybe I need to address it. Okay, I'm going to leave on that note. <laughs> awesome being with you. Oh, you too, more as always. And see you, see everyone soon. Thank you. Okay, Bye. thanks. Bye-bye. That's it for today. To hear more LinkedIn Lives, head over to my profile on LinkedIn where they're all indexed. You can subscribe to my newsletter too. And be sure to subscribe or follow the Anxious Achiever feed for more of these conversations, as well as my regular podcast episodes.